Hello everyone. As part of our Better Outcomes webinar series, I'd like to thank you for joining us online today for this very special live broadcast. My name is Emily Eberly with Sachs Healthcare Communications and I am your technical producer. It is my pleasure today to welcome you to our webinar called High Flow Nasal Cannula and Non-Invasive Ventilation, Current Evidence and Practice. And now, I'd like to introduce you to Michael Gentile, who is our moderator today. Mike is an associate in research for the Division of Critical Care Medicine at Duke University Medical Center and School of Medicine in Durham, North Carolina. He has been involved with clinical practice, research, and teaching related to respiratory and critical care for 30 years. Mike has published numerous abstracts, manuscripts, and textbook chapters. Mike, welcome, and I'm so glad to be working with you for this special session, and we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people today. Are you ready to get started? Good afternoon, or morning, wherever you are in time zones. Thank you, Emily, for that very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is High Flow Nasal Cannula and Non-Invasive Ventilation, Current Evidence and Practice. We are very fortunate to have an extremely qualified speaker today presenting on this very important and timely topic. Speaking today on this topic is a good colleague of mine, Tom Perino. Tom is currently uh, a clinical specialist at St. Michael's Hospital Center of Excellence in Mechanical Ventilation in Toronto, Ontario. He also is an adjunct lecturer in the Department of Anesthesia Division of Critical Care at McMaster University. Prior to this current position, uh, Tom was a clinical educator for respiratory therapy services at St. Joseph's Healthcare in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. His publication expertise includes several peer review articles and studies, as well as being on editorial boards for the Restorative Care Journal, Restorative Care, or Canadian Journal of Restorative Therapy. Tom is a highly sought after speaker and is presented at several international and national conferences. Today, uh, Tom has disclosures for consulting and speaking for Drager, Malcroft, and Phillips Healthcare. This is a, uh, a slide that will tell you this educational activity is approved for one contact hour. Um, and we'll go over this at the end, so don't uh, be afraid if you miss these very important details. A link to uh, get these CE credits is available at the conclusion of the webinar today and will also be posted online. Uh, support for this educational uh, uh, activity was provided by Philips Healthcare. Uh, and so with that, um, I'm ready to turn it over to Tom. Uh, Tom, are you ready? I'm ready, thank you very much, Michael. I hope everyone can hear me. Let's get started, and let's begin with the learning objectives for the presentation are to review the evidence-based practice of non-invasive ventilation, describe the delivery and mechanisms of action related to high-flow nasal cannula, and to review the literature landscape comparing non-invasive to high-flow nasal cannula. <clears throat> now, when a patient is in respiratory failure, if they require urgent intubation, the type of failure doesn't change the fact that you require a mechanical ventilator to manage a respiratory failure. And you should hopefully be using this ventilator in a way that protects the lung. In attempt to prevent intubation, the type of failure has traditionally influenced the choice of supportive therapy. So for type 1 hypoxemic failure, the choice is typically supplemental oxygen, and positive pressure ventilation is typical for type 2 hypercarbic failure. The goals of respiratory support, non-invasive support, of course, you have to investigate and treat the underlying cause. This is up to the whole medical team to provide this, uh, this investigation to try to figure out what is causing this issue and try to uh, hopefully treat it and hopefully present, prevent it in the future. Um, but of course, we have the more acute things that we have to deal with, like making sure that we provide sufficient oxygenation, we need to support oxygenation, try to reduce work of breathing, do our best to keep the patients comfortable. And all of this um, is equivalent whether it's invasive or non-invasive ventilation. However, when it comes to invasive ventilation, we often add this whole idea of protecting the lung and making sure that we don't cause lung injury. But this isn't always uh, at the forefront of uh, providing non-invasive therapy. But I will talk a little bit about this during this presentation. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Now the literature for non-invasive ventilation is growing at an exponential rate and becomes very challenging for clinicians to stay up to date with current evidence. Luckily, there are things such as clinical practice guidelines that are published that basically systematically review the literature to provide evidence-based recommendations to help guide clinical practice. This guideline published in 2011 by the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group assessed the literature related to non-invasive use in, a, in the listed patient populations from COPD exacerbation, asthma, acute lung injury, uh, immunosuppression during bronchoscopy. As you can see, the list is quite extensive for all of the conditions that have been researched with non-invasive ventilation. And I'm preferring to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation right now, BiPAP or CPAP as otherwise uh, referred to. And with these guidelines, they essentially found that these clinical scenarios here, COPD exacerbation, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, immunosuppression, early extubation for COPD, transition after planned extubation in high-risk patients, so patients at high risk of failing extubation, and treatment of acute respiratory failure after surgery. Now, these were the only ones that had a recommendation supporting its use, and they used the grade scoring system. If you're not familiar with the grade scoring system, one is related to strong evidence, two is weak evidence, a indicates that further research is unlikely to change that recommendation. B is that further research likely will change the recommendation. And C is that further research is very likely to change the recommendation. So as you can see for COPD exacerbation and cardiogenic pulmonary edema, we have strong evidence and an A grade essentially means that further research is unlikely going to change the recommendation that non-invasive ventilation is a good strategy for managing these patients. Now the problems with guidelines is that they're not usually updated as fast as the literature is published. So for example, I'm going to focus for a moment on the last one there, the treatment of acute respiratory failure after surgery. Currently the only recommendation in the literature that they have is weak evidence. Um, and again, that further research is very likely to change this recommendation. And they only have this specifically for lung resection patients in terms of recommending its use. Now, more recently, we actually have a trial that was um, looking at non-invasive ventilation in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure within seven days of abdominal surgery. So they weren't extubated to BiPAP. This is just if they went into hypoxic failure, they would be treated with non-invasive ventilation or with standard care, which is oxygen therapy. And this was 293 patients. As you can see, the, the use of non-invasive ventilation reduced the incidence of reintubation in these patient in this patient population. So the reason why I like to bring this up is, as you can see, guidelines come out, but further evidence may come along that either supports or refutes. And this is just an example of more supportive data for the use of non-invasive ventilation in post-operative patients, and this specifically with abdominal patients abdominal surgery patients, I should clarify. Now, where we have very mixed evidence, um, because we lack consistent data, and therefore we lack clinical guideline recommendations related to it, are in patients with acute respiratory failure due to a community-acquired pneumonia, hypoxic respiratory failure, which is sometimes referred to as de novo hypoxemic respiratory failure, which essentially means not of the usual causes um, that would typically um, require non-invasive ventilation, and Essentially, when non-invasive is used in these patient populations, um, it has been extensively studied, and what has been studied along with it are risk factors for failure. So the literature has shown time and time again that failing non-invasive is associated with an increased risk of mortality. Therefore, if you are treating these patients without clinical guideline recommendations because the evidence is so inconsistent, we should be very aware of the risk factors for treatment failure and hopefully monitor them closely so that we can uh, ensure that our patients are not uh, harmed um, by providing care beyond uh, the timeline that we should. Now, before we get into the key factors for failure, which I will review, let's just quickly review some of the settings for non-invasive ventilation. Um, inspiratory pressure, of, and I'm sure most of you are aware, is the pressure that is reached during, an insp during inspiration, uh, usually triggered by the patient. Um, expiratory pressure is the amount of positive airway pressure provided during exhalation. And of course, the difference between those two pressures is the support level. Now, depending on the device you're using, you may be setting an IPAP, for example, in this example in my graphic of 14, or an EPAP of 6, so you may be setting 14 on 6 as we usually refer to it as, or you may be setting the actual support level. So many ICU ventilators, you would set the pressure support level above a PEEP or CPAP level, for example. 
So you may provide just CPAP, um, or if you're providing dual pressures, you have an IPAP and EPAP, um, or on ventilators, typically it's referred to as pressure support and, and PEEP. And of course, you have different modes that are available, respiratory rates as a setting, rise time, inspiratory time, and FiO2. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, not just the mode, but more specifically respiratory rates. It should be understood by all clinicians that when we use an ST mode, which is typical of uh, patients um, that are on some standalone devices where ST is the only mode, it's important to understand that the respiratory rate should not be set close to the patient's own respiratory rate. And this is because this can lead to significant asynchronies with the patient. So for standalone devices, the inspiratory time uh, that you set, for example, is only active during a mandatory breath. And that mandatory breath is only delivered when the patient's respiratory rate is less than the set rate. So how can this lead to asynchronies? Well, I'll give an example of 20 breaths per minute. If, the, if it's 20 breaths per minute set on the machine, the patient has three seconds to make a spontaneous effort before the machine kicks in and forces another breath to the patient, regardless of whether they want it or not. So if the underlying rate, if their underlying rate is close to 20 but fluctuates, this can lead to asynchronies when the ventilator is forcing not only a breath but also a breath with a fixed time. So it's important to understand to keep the respiratory rate set lower than their respiratory rate. Uh, now, leak compensation is not typically an adjustable setting, but I want to bring it up because it is mandatory for non-invasive uh, ventilator, uh, non-invasive ventilators to, de uh, to function as a device uh, because of the leaks related to the interface because it's not, of course, invasive with an endotracheal tube. Here's an example of uh, some of the non-invasive uh, um, uh, masks that are out there in the literature. Um, the one on the left, again, a full face mask and then you have the total face mask where you're covering the eyes and the mouth. These are just common in acute care. There are a number of interfaces but these are probably the most common in acute care. The one on the far right is the helmet device which is more commonly used in Europe but a recent randomized control trial that I won't, I won't review in this in this presentation uh, was published last year and it led and it, it will likely lead to further studies uh, looking at the physiological benefits of this type of interface uh, because it was the study was in significantly in favor of this helmet device. Now from a North American perspective, I'm not sure if it's available in the United States, but it just became available in Canada recently. Um, so this is why there's not a lot of research being done uh, within, the, uh, within North America related to this device, but there's a significant amount being done in Europe. Now, some other considerations prior to getting into the risk factors. Um, not a lot of clinicians may understand this, but most of the research studies uh, dealing with non-invasive ventilation don't use expiratory pressures above 10 centimeters of water for the reason that it contributes significantly to interface leaks. So they will usually write it into the protocol that the EPAP pressure is titrated between 5 and 10 or it was not increased beyond 10 due to leaks. Um, I've only found one study that used 12 centimeters of water and that was for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So the majority of the evidence out there in terms of what we're trying to apply best practice at the bedside, the evidence actually limits the use of expiratory pressure. And when it comes to IPAP, it's typically mentioned that IPAP is titrated, usually to relieve dyspnea in the patient. So not necessarily for targeting tidal volume, uh, but usually inspiratory effort. And one of the things that needs to be considered, and this was uh, demonstrated quite nicely in uh, Dr. Slutsky's article in New England Journal of Medicine in 2013 about ventilator-induced lung injury, saying that if someone's spontaneous effort is significantly high, so in this example, their pleural pressure drops to negative 15 centimeters of water, even a low alveolar pressure of 10 centimeters of water can cause a transpulmonary pressure of 25 centimeters of water. Therefore, we could be contributing to lung injury in these patients. And so therefore, if we're not paying close attention, perhaps to the tidal volume being generated by these strong efforts, we may be missing something. And what I tend to think might happen because of the lack of understanding of all this is that the use of non-invasive in the real world practice is more like the Wild West, um, where we are trying our best to make patients comfortable, we're trying to improve their blood gases, and we may not recognize other issues like an increasing leak in the interface that, you know, hopefully we're not strapping the mask tighter, but if we are because the interface is leaking more, is it because we're using pressures that haven't been used in research, so therefore we don't know if they're actually beneficial, um, or are we allowing patients to indraw large amounts of tidal volume just because we're trying to support their efforts? So I think, you know, we need to be aware of what the literature has done and what it can recommend, and then sort of reflect on our practice.
So the key risk factors for treatment failure, now this is a combination. What I've done is I've combined risk factors for both hypercarbic respiratory failure and hypoxemic respiratory failure studies. And I've grouped um, a number of them that are sort of consistent and some that are, that are unique to hypoxic failure. But I've grouped and get them together into this table when I've categorized them from the patient and medical condition um, to the respiratory parameters, essentially the, um, the respiratory status related to gas exchange, measured values through patient monitoring, and then the patient response. So for patient and medical condition, their age, level of consciousness, severity of illness, and use of vasopressors, shock, uh, so if the patient's in septic shock, for example, are very high indicators of they're going to likely fail non-invasive if they have a, if they're very severe, uh, if they have a very high severity of illness score and they're on uh, vasopressors for shock, they're likely to fail. For COPD patients with a pH less than 7.25, they are more likely to fail. And in fact, most patients with pH less than 7.25 are not even included in non-invasive ventilation studies. So that's also something to keep in mind when you're applying non-invasive to a patient uh, with a pH less than 7.25, that we don't have evidence that this is actually helpful. Uh, for hypoxemic respiratory failure patients, having a pH that is less than 7.35, so less than normal, is, an is again, is a risk a risk factor. Doesn't mean they're going to fail, but just all of these things combined can indicate that your patient may likely fail. Uh, SATs less than 90 for more than five minutes and a low baseline PF ratio of less than 150. For monitoring at the bedside, recent studies, and I'm going to review these first two uh, in more detail, tidal volumes greater than 9.5 mils per kilo of predicted body weight have been associated with failure in hypoxemic respiratory patients managed with non-invasive ventilation, and something called a HACOR score, and I'll review this, uh, greater than 5 at 1 hour uh, was, a high, was a very good predictor of failing non-invasive ventilation. And of course, intolerance of interfaces is another one that we can easily monitor at the bedside. Um, response to the patient, uh, so if they're failing within one to two hours, uh, this is an indicator, or sorry, they should they, if they're failing to improve within one to two hours, then this is a key indicator of failure. So success of non-invasive non ventilation is not, it doesn't take hours to sort this out. Now for predicting failure, this is the, the study I mentioned about tidal volume. When they looked at patients with, in the overall population, uh, even in patients with mild and moderate uh, ARDS, or sorry, hypoxemia, based on the PF ratios um, of the Berlin definition, so these patients didn't all necessarily have ARDS, uh, but they had PF ratios consistent with ARDS. So mild would have been PF ratios between 2 and 300, and then the other group was all less than 200. And in all groups, at least 50% of the patients were receiving tidal volumes that we would consider injurious on invasive ventilation. And when it comes to the variables that were associated with failing non-invasive, the usual suspects were associated with non-invasive failure, so immunosuppression, low PF ratio at baseline, uh, again, severity of illness scores. But then they also measured minute ventilation and tidal volume at the beginning and end of each non-invasive uh, non-invasive ventilation session and averaged them. And what they found was that the success and failure was mainly driven by patients with moderate to severe ARDS, but with those patients with PF ratios less than 200, the threshold for failure was 9.5 mils per kilo of predicted body weight. And it had a sensitivity and specificity that was quite high, so 82 and 87% respectively, um, that predicted failure of these patients. They, the authors do conclude that this should be tested in a randomized control trial, but uh, the results tend to essentially makes sense. I mean, we, we know lung protective ventilation is important in invasive ventilation, and it's not surprising that it may predict failure in patients that are being non-invasively ventilated. Now, if you're wondering if the patients that failed were, they just had more or higher pressure support, and that's why their tidal volumes were higher, they did demonstrate that the pressure support settings during non-invasive ventilation were, uh, were equivalent, they, so they were not significantly different between the two groups. Now, the HACOR score is one that I found quite interesting. This was a study published in Intensive Care Medicine last year. There was 449 patients included in the testing cohort where they gathered all this information and tried to figure out if there was a scoring system they could use with heart rate, acidosis, consciousness, oxygenation, and respiratory rate to see if non-invasive ventilation failure could have been predicted. So then they took this equation and tested it in 358 patients. And the study looked... Um, so one of the things I like to point out, sorry, <laughs> this was my joke and I totally just crashed it. Uh, I think if I named the study, I would have rearranged the uh, HACOR score uh, to say something a little more exciting like roach, but I'm not sure people would want to uh, talk about this in the ICU. Someone might get scared. 
not, I'm not a comedian, obviously. Uh, so here, um, th th this is a table. So if you read the study that I mentioned on the previous page, if you want to see what the scoring system is, you'd have to download the supplemental data. However, I do review this study and the previous one. Actually, a number of these studies published in 2016. I did um, mention them and talk about these in my 2016 year in review that was published last month in respiratory care. And I do provide the table with the scoring system, looking at heart rate, pH, GCS, PF ratio, and breathing frequency, or respiratory rate. And basically, they found that a HACOR score greater than 5 at 1 hour had a diagnostic accuracy of predicting non-invasive failure at 81.8% in the test group and 86% in the validation group. So again, very good predictive value. Another interesting part of this study that was uh, was found is they looked at the time to intubation. So this is all of the patients that did have a HACOR score greater than five at one hour, so they were highly predictive of failing. They looked at patients that were intubated less than 12 hours and those that were intubated after 12 hours, and there was a significant difference in hospital mortality between the two groups. You can see 66% in the group that was intubated early and 79% in the group that was intubated late. Having said that, both of these are quite high in in terms of uh, mortality, hospital mortality. So as I already mentioned, non-invasive ventilation failure is associated with higher mortality. But if you delay intubation of these patients, it's significantly higher. This also supported previous data published in 2012 where they looked at patients with de novo hypoxemic respiratory failure. And again, I will uh, re-mentioned that the HACOR score was in patients that were treated with um, hypoxic respiratory failure with non-invasive ventilation. And this study showed the same uh, problem with when there is a delay in extubation, or sorry, in intubation of these patients treated with non-invasive, there is an increase in mortality for patients that are in hypoxic de novo failure. Whereas patients with underlying cardiac and respiratory disease, the delay in intubation actually didn't change mortality in this study. So I, I think, again, we're, we're sort of getting to this point where hypoxic patients, maybe more particularly patients that are in moderate to severe uh, ARDS category of hypoxia, uh, may not ventilate from non-invasive ventilation, and we probably should be looking for other answers to manage these patients. So the changing landscape is that many non-invasive studies compared non-invasive to standard oxygen therapy. So non-invasive was superior in some, in, in some studies over uh, oxygen therapy. However, these standard oxygen therapy devices have many limitations, and many of you are, may, are likely um, aware of some of these things. So one of them is that oxygen supply in the hospital typically have no humidification coming from the wall, so this has a significant drying effect. And um, <clears throat> In the total flow to the patient, uh, if, if the total flow to the patient, sorry, is um, higher or lower than their inspiratory demand, then the FIO2 becomes unreliable because they're essentially drawing in room air. So changes in inspiratory effort results in changes in FIO2. And air entrainment devices normally output uh, lower flow when FIO2 is increased. And this is uh, demonstrated by the typical magic box that we all learn as uh, respiratory therapy students. And this is just looking at air entrainment, just calculated for the different percent uh, oxygen levels here. And you can see that as the oxygen percent goes up with an air entrainment device, typically the total flow to the patient goes down. So I have had clinically an experience where I've turned a patient with COPD from 24% up to 40% and then continued to argue for the next five minutes that I did not turn their oxygen down, but they were insistent that I turn their oxygen down. And what had happened is the total flow rate to them had gone down, and to them that flow blowing in their face, that's the oxygen. So they were right, uh, the flow was lower, but not the FiO2, and they, to them it just didn't matter, it was the flow that they were after. So there was a need um, in terms of devices. We needed something that could possibly meet the inspiratory demand of a patient at a constant flow rate that didn't change as you adjusted FiO2. It needed to be heated and humidified for delivering a high flow of a dry gas. You don't want to dry these patients out. And hopefully comfortable to improve patient tolerance of therapy. In steps something such as high flow nasal cannula. Um, so this is just an example of one of the devices out there um, where you have humidified gas delivered to a patient with a uh, large bore cannula. And the cannula should not occlude the nares. This is not a CPAP mask. We're not trying to use like um, the nasal pillows. It's not to occlude the air. You have to make sure there's a, a gap around the, uh, the cannula to make sure that there's a, there we allow flushing of CO2, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but the flow rates are typically set between 30 and 60 liters per minute. Um, clinically, 40 to 50 is where you'll see a lot of uh, the more recent studies sort of hitting a sweet spot. And really what we have here are nasal cannula, 
that won't burn your nose at high flows. So they're more tolerated and more comfortable uh, than some of the other dry uh, oxygen mask uh, options we have. So the application is quite easy. Uh, there's really not, there's no modes, et cetera. You just have to choose the appropriate cannula size, choose the appropriate flow rate for the patient, and then adjust your FiO2 as required to maintain target saturation. Uh, for weaning it, typically you'd probably want to wean your FiO2 to, to your FiO2 first, and then follow up by weaning, weaning your uh, flow in liters per minute. Um, minimum flow rate, again, this is just based on some hospital policies that I've seen out there, where once you get to 20 liters per minute and you watch for signs of increased work of breathing, and if they seem comfortable and they tolerate low FiO2 at low flow rates, you can consider switching them to standard O2 therapy devices. If you don't have a number of devices available for all of your patients, this could be a good guideline to say, okay, this patient can probably be tolerated or can probably be managed um, safely on different oxygen therapy device, let's free this oxygen device or this uh, high flow device up for another patient now. In terms of um, literature supporting not our high flow nasal cannula, this was a landmark study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015, and I would say rapidly brought the use of high flow nasal cannula into the spotlight. Um, I had already been following a lot of the literature. I was working at St. Joseph's in Hamilton, and we had been using the device already for a number of years prior to this. Um, but this was a multi-center study of just over 300 patients that got a lot more physicians and clinicians talking about high flow nasal cannula. They randomized patients, again, these were patients in, I'll just review again, um, hypoxemic, so acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. They excluded patients with high CO2s and low pH, so they were not looking at COPD patients, this is just hypoxemic failure. They compared heated high flow nasal cannula with non-invasive ventilation and nominative breather masks, so it was sort of a three-way randomized control trial. And what they found was their primary outcome, interestingly enough, was to see whether or not there were less intubations uh, between the groups based on the therapy they were receiving. Now, the high flow oxygen group, so the high flow nasal cannula group, although it appears lower on this graph, uh, you can see that the p-value was not significant. So there was not a significant reduction in intubation, which was their primary endpoint. But what was surprising is that when they took that primary endpoint and looked at just the patients with more, a more severe hypoxic condition, so they, they included patients with PF ratios less than 300. They said, well, what about the sicker ones, the ones with PF ratios less than 200? Um, and they found that high flinasal cannula did significantly reduce the incidence of intubation in the patients who were more hypoxic. Again, this is the patient population that has been linked to very high um, mortality when non-invasive fails. So if these therapies fail, these patients may be at higher risk of mortality. And that's actually what they found with their secondary outcomes. So the death both in ICU and at 90 days was significantly less in the group with high nasal cannula. So just to give you an example in terms of percentages, we have 19% in the standard oxygen group, 25% mortality. This is ICU mortality in the non-invasive ventilation group, and 11% in the high flow nasal cannula group. For the 90-day mortality, we have 28 in the non-invasive, 23 in standard oxygen therapy, and 12 in the high flow nasal cannula group. So as I mentioned, this sort of brought into the spotlight high flow nasal cannula for a lot of people. More recent studies have started to look at, okay, so if that happened, why? What's the possible mechanism of action? Like, why are these patients doing better on these therapies? This study was published recently uh, by Tommaso Maris and his colleagues in uh, Italy. They looked at 15 patients treated with, and they treated them both with oxygen face mask and high flow nasal cannula, and just wanted to compare physiological variables. So they actually put esophageal balloons in these patients. They measured uh, the change in esophageal pressure, which represents your work of breathing, as well as your pressure time product, which is your work of breathing. Um, they looked at end expiratory transpulmonary pressure, respiratory rate, all your blood gas variables, hemodynamics, et cetera. And again, what was interesting is that compared to an oxygen face mask, a uh, high flow nasal cannula had a reduction in the change in esophageal pressure. So that's a, redu a reduction in inspiratory effort. Um, they actually uh, had a reduction in um, the pressure time product. Interestingly enough, the end expiratory transpulmonary pressure was higher which it was quite negative. It was negative 10 in the oxygen therapy group once they switched into high flow. And these aren't just, by the way, I shouldn't say in the oxygen therapy group. These are the same patients, but were basically tested first on an oxygen mask and then switched over, or they were randomized to start with high flow and then switch to oxygen mask. So they were looking at the same patients, but their, their um, response physiologically to changing therapy. So an increase in end expiratory uh, transpulmonary pressure is important. Um, we have an improvement in PF ratio and 
So these are some of the physiological aspects that are changing that we don't see at the bedside. These are all parameters and things that are measured with more uh, advanced uh, respiratory monitoring, um, but there's reasons for this. So this was an editorial published in the Blue Journal uh, by a colleague, Ewan Gulliger and uh, Dr. Art Sletsky, um, looking at the physiological effects of high nasal cannula. And you can see there's five main points that, that we're looking at in terms of what's different with this compared to other oxygen therapy devices. It's heated and humidified inhaled gas. It washes out upper airways, so it actually reduces the anatomical dead space. As the patient exhales, you have a fresh gas flow flushing out that CO2 that they're exhaling, so your dead space, your anatomical dead space is reduced. We have high inspiratory flows into the nares, we have positive airway pressure that could be generated, and we have entrainment of ambient air is less with these devices because it meets the patient's inspired flow demand. Now, when you look all the way down through all these mechanisms, you see that you know they basically improve the comfort and tolerance of the patients. It can offload some of the worker breathing, so diaphragm load and injury, decrease ventilator-induced lung injury if you're reducing the rate or the amount of inspiratory uh, pressure being generated, and of course, keeping oxygenation uh, stable so that when patients are breathing at different uh, flow rates, et cetera, uh, inspired flow rates that they're not reducing their FiO2, so it keeps that oxygenation up. And this is why we think there it's resulting in improved clinical outcomes. Now, one of the patient populations that have been um, controversial in terms of invasively ventilating them, up until recently, non-invasive ventilation has been shown to be uh, the way to go with immunocompromised patients to avoid intubation. Um, there's a couple of studies that have come out recently looking at high flanasal cannula in immunocompromised patients. And again, this is with acute respiratory failure. They looked at 115 immunocompromised patients. They compared the outcomes with high flanasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation. This was a study published last year. And you can see that the non-invasive group um, had less survival than the high flanasal cannula group. Now there's obviously a number of factors that could be related to this, so they looked at all the associated factors for not only associated with intubation, but also um, um, the use of, or sorry, the uh, mortality at 28 days. And what they found, again, a lot of the usual suspects, again, uh, we have simply, again, a higher severity score, et cetera, use of vasopressors, um, age, and what was interesting is they found non-invasive ventilation as first-line therapy, therapy to be associated with this, um, with these, with these issues. So what they did is they did a uh, propensity score match these patients um, to look and see, okay, well let's match them for all those other variables, and then just look at those two variables, whether they had non-invasive ventilation as a uh, as a uh, primary uh, mode or as an initial mode of ventilation, uh, and or high flow nasal cannula. And when this propensity score match them, again, you see non-invasive is associated with higher mortality, as is higher intubation rates and mortality of those intubated patients. So we're getting to the point now where it seems that immunocompromised patients really should likely be managed with the least invasive methods as possible. Um, there, I just saw an abstract yesterday, actually, from uh, some colleagues here in Toronto. Uh, they did a systematic review. It's not published yet, but I just can comment briefly on the abstract. They looked at high flanasal cannula compared to standard oxygen therapy mask uh, in patients with immunocompromised, again, looking at the literature out there. And they also looked at the non-invasive literature, and yes, they did find that oxygen therapy is definitely superior to non-invasive in this population in terms of reducing mortality or in favor of uh, oxygen therapy rather than non-invasive. Uh, um, interestingly enough, one of the comparisons they made was a standard oxygen mask to high flow nasal cannula, and they did not find a difference in the literature for immunocompromised patients between those, those two groups. But more studies were needed. There were very few studies um, that were available that looked specifically at that, but just, just more things coming down the pipeline that are leaning towards the least invasive method of managing uh, immunocompromised patients is probably the important. Now, the effects of post-extubation in, in patients that are at low risk, so this is just your average patient that gets extubated in the ICU. This study by Hernandez published in JAMA last year looked at 527 patients considered very low risk for extubation failure, and they randomized them to receive the standard nasal cannula or non-rebreather mask or a high flow nasal cannula. And they found an all-cause um, reintubation was lower with the high flow nasal cannula. Now, this number of 12% um, in the conventional group is considered low reintubation rate. That's that's close to normal for for most ICUs, but it was significantly lower in the high flow nasal cannula group, which is which is was surprising because these patients are not at high risk of failing. 
Um, <clears throat> again, you can see you can see overall um, the change over time. So 72 hours, you can just see the separation in a Kaplan-Meier uh, analysis. I just like these graphs, so I like to put them up, but it tells you the same thing as the previous slide. So I'll move on. Um, then they took this idea and said, well, what about patients at high risk of failure? So we know that patients at high risk of failure, the recommendation, the guidelines again, um, based on the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group article I started off this presentation with, recommends the use of non-invasive ventilation for high risk patients post extubation. So for this randomized trial, they did what's called a non-inferiority study. So when something's already recommended by the literature and the guidelines, you test to see if something is inferior or not to it. So they looked at 604 patients that met criteria for extubation failure. Now keep in mind, there's not a standard list of what means uh, you're at high risk of failure. So they, it was a large list of, list of uh, conditions that were placing these patients at higher risk of extubation failure. Um, the interventions they did for 24 hours, either high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation. Now the 24 hour mark has to do with their hospital policy for transitioning patients out of the ICU. It's not likely what would happen in real practice. If someone is tolerating high flow nasal cannula, it doesn't mean they're gonna get sent out of ICU the next day. So most hospitals, at least the ones I've worked in, don't have a policy that after 24 hours, you have to stop that therapy. Um, now their inferiority cutoff was 10%. So if the difference was more than 10%, they would consider it inferior. Um, now, what was interesting in all cause reintubation, they had a difference of 3.7%. So it did not cross the inferiority mark. So meaning high flow nasal cannula was not inferior to non-invasive ventilation. So you could provide this safely. And the post extubation respiratory failure, interestingly enough, the number says 12.9%, but that's actually in favor of the high flow nasal cannula. So again, not inferior to non-invasive ventilation. So if you have a patient that you're extubating to non-invasive ventilation, it's and they're not tolerating it, if you have the ability to deliver high flow nasal cannula, clearly it's not inferior to do so. Um, I still personally, and this is my personal opinion, if I know my patient has underlying COPD or chronic lung disease with high levels of CO2, um, I would probably choose non-invasive right now because we have more data specific to that patient population. This study looked at all patients at, at high risk and they did not separate patients with underlying um, COPD. Um, again, when, the reason why I show the graph for this now is you can see up until 24 hours, there really is no difference in the reintubation rates. After 24 hours, remember at 24 hours, they stopped the therapy on both groups, and there seems to be a separation between high flow with, with higher intubations occurring in the, in the high flow group. When you look at this graph, you have to understand the scale and the fact that after 72 hours, that difference is only 3.7%, which to them statistically was not inferior to non-invasive ventilation, but something to consider. Um, there was no difference in 28 day mortality between the two groups, as demonstrated by this Kaplan-Meier analysis as well. And one, one final study I'll talk about, high flow nasal cannula post-extubation. So they did post-extubation, post-surgery, abdominal surgery patients compared to conventional oxygen therapy, so high flow versus conventional post-extubation these patients to see if they could prevent um, the development of respiratory failure and therefore or reintubation in those patients. Uh, they found overall there was no significant difference managing patients with high flow nasal cannula to standard oxygen therapy in terms of uh, post-operative pulmonary complications. So they compared the two within seven days. There was no difference whether or not you treated with, them with high flow or not. If they were going to get uh, any post-operative pulmonary, post pulmonary complications, um, being on one therapy did not provide any benefit. Now, there was a nice editorial that, um, pu published in Intensive Care Medicine that sort of looked at this. Uh, Post-operatively, we know patients may have developed some atelectasis during their surgery. So if, in patients with minor atelectasis, high flow nasal cannula or oxygen therapy may be completely fine. High flow nasal cannula may be better in that patient population. Uh, but when it comes to patient, if they, patients that have major um, atelectasis occurring, then likely the high flow nasal cannula or oxygen therapy likely won't uh, perform as well as providing some, some standard set positive pressure to try and recuperate and try to recruit those lungs, uh, recuperate those alveolar older units that may have been collapsed during surgery. So this may explain why um, the one of the previous studies I mentioned that adds supportive data to the literature regarding post-operative management of, of failure, um, these patients may just have not recovered from their atelectasis and therefore treating them with non-invasive is, is a good option.
So to summarize sort of the clinical scenarios that I've, uh, that I've looked at um, and mentioned in this, uh, in this talk, um, COPD exacerbation and cardiogenic pulmonary edema at this time, we only have significant strong data supporting non-invasive ventilation uh, for those groups. And again, with a pH between 7.25 and 7.35 for COPD exacerbations, keeping in mind that pH less than that, those patients were not included in the study. Uh, for cardiogenic pulmonary edema, again, we still just have non-invasive as a, as a gold standard recommendation, 1A evidence. Um, doesn't mean that studies won't come out looking at non-inferiority to these two, but if they did have studies comparing COPD exacerbation with non-invasive and high flow, they would likely be a non-inferiority study or because we already know that there, we have evidence to support better outcomes with non-invasive. So it's likely not going to improve upon that, but it may be as good. We don't know yet. Uh, we have to study this. Immunocompromised patients, non-invasive ventilation was shown earlier to be better than invasive ventilation, but I think we're leaning more towards not just high flow nasal cannula, but oxygen therapy in general and trying to reduce the amount of uh, positive pressure delivered to these patients. Um, Post-extubation failure, uh, patient, patients at high risk of failure, we now have a non-inferiority study showing that you could do either or with these patients and feel comfortable about it. Um, again, I added that caveat that if they had underlying COPD, you might want to lean towards non-invasive, but they didn't, um, they generalized their population and they included all those patients and they found it not to be inferior. Uh, Post-extubation with COPD, so early liberation, this is one of the recommendations in the, uh, in the clinical guidelines I mentioned earlier. Um, we don't have this sort of data um, in high nasal cannula. These are patients that may not meet your spontaneous breathing trial um, uh, criteria, but they have underlying COPD, so you just decided to get them off the vent earlier. Um, and then for hypoxemic respiratory failure patients, the with PF ratios 200 to 300, um, it looks like non-invasive ventilation and high nasal cannula both could be considered. Uh, with PF ratios less than 200, it's leaning more towards th therapies such as high nasal cannula over non-invasive. And just a quick reminder, I won't go through these again, but just please try and remember your risk uh, factors for failure. Learn them, understand them, pay more attention to them. Um, I think as clinicians, we sometimes get rushed because we're seeing a lot of patients, we, have, we get called away, so we may not be paying close enough attention to some of these things, but I think if we were to pay closer attention to these things, we may improve the outcomes of our patients. And please remember, do not delay intubation in hypoxemic patients that meet these criteria. It's very important to recognize these patients earlier to try and minimize the uh, adverse outcomes that could happen. And with that, I'm going to conclude uh, my presentation, and I thank you very much for uh, attending and listening, and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mike to uh, facilitate some question and answers. Mike, are you there? I am here, and Tom, thank you for a great talk uh, with some very timely uh, uh, information and summarizing many studies. Now we're going to move to some questions, and I want to thank uh, all the participants today. We have a, a number of great questions, and what I'm going to do is try and break them up into the two topics of non-invasive ventilation and then high flow nasal cannula. And so, Tom, if you can comment, most of the, the uh, literature you presented today was on adult patients. Uh, do you have any comments uh, regarding non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal cannula in pediatric patients? So I, I will apologize that my niche uh, is adult critical care. Uh, I do know that the excitement for this type of therapy is just as high in the pediatric population. Um, I know there are published studies looking at this and there are ongoing studies looking at uh, not only different categories of patients with a high flow, um, but also um, comparing to non-invasive ventilation. Um, I don't know, Mike, if you are familiar specifically with a number that maybe you could help out with that, but I, I do, I do uh, tend to lean towards the adult critical care. Uh, when I look at this, I find it, uh, it tends to have the larger numbers, <laughs> uh, but uh, perhaps you could comment on that. So those of you in the audience, if you look at your service area and you look at the number of adult ICU beds, they're probably much, 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 much greater than those of pediatric intensive care. So the numbers, especially for non-invasive ventilation, there is a, a not much, uh, especially randomized controlled trials on this topic. The evidence, though, in neonates and pediatrics for high-flow nasal cannula, um, there's many reports uh, regarding that. So maybe that is a topic we can do for another webcast. Yes, the next I, I can quickly. 
Sorry, Mike. Um, I, I could comment briefly. There, there are definitely some studies looking at uh, high-flow nasal cannula in neonates, uh, both post um, post birth and and basically uh, post extubation as well. Uh, post extubation seems to be pretty promising um, as a replacement to CPAP. There's one study that showed similarities um, compared to CPAP post extubation. However, um, in patients. Um, or in infants that are uh, premature, um, that data doesn't really hold true or doesn't hold the same sort of weight. So it's important that when you're looking at the literature to pay very close attention when you're looking at the, uh, the neonate literature, pay close attention to the weight and uh, gestational age of the, of the, um, of the uh, patients to make sure that you're not overgeneralizing the results of, of those studies. Okay, thank you, Tom. A question that was brought forth by Kristen and then several other people where you spoke about a SpO2 less than 90 for five minutes. And several of us who've done uh, non-invasive ventilation for a long time, that was sort of a surprise. If you can comment a little bit on that. Yes, that risk factor was specifically for hypoxemic patients, not COPD patients. We tend to target COPD levels between 88 and 92. Um, that less than 90% for five minutes. For those excited about high nasal cannula, they need to be aware that in the New England Journal of Medicine, that landmark paper by Fratt um, and colleagues that I mentioned, um, they, that was one of their criteria for failure. Uh, of oxygen therapy providing intubation. That was one of the criteria that had to be met, which was SATs less than 90 for more than five minutes. Again, these are not patients where you would want to accept those saturations. These are just hypoxemic patients that no matter what you do, whatever intervention you have, you can't increase their SATs above 90% uh, for more than five minutes. So these patients would likely, in terms of clinically, this is what they would look like. They would be on 100% FiO2 with SATs less than 90 for five minutes. It's not meaning if your SATs drop below 90, you don't do anything. Clearly the first step would be to increase your FiO2, but it's if you can't manage them on, you know, a high level of FiO2, perhaps 100%, um, if they're still saturating that low after five minutes, you should consider in intubating that patient. Again, just hypoxic patients, not COPD. So I hope that, that sort of clarifies. It does. Thank you. Uh, another question that was brought forth by Patricia was, in the patients on non-invasive ventilation who also have uh, obesity or OSA, and that the EPAP needs to be much higher than and, or of 10, and but they can't really help uh, go above that, and they also have hypercarbia, uh, can you comment on that? Because I think a lot of your data was on more respiratory failure. Yes, I can comment on that. So you are absolutely right. If you are aware of a patient's underlying uh, OSA level, then typically that EPAP level should not be less than that level if you're aware, if you're aware of that level. Um, th the problem with the literature um, is that many of those patients, again, particularly the morbidly obese patients, are generally not included in many of these studies. So part of the exclusion criteria for many studies would be patients with BMIs above this, et cetera, or a weight above this. So it becomes challenging to know exactly what's the best practice, for example, for a patient who is morbidly obese that you know has severe OSA, may require higher pressures just because of abdominal issues when in certain positions because their chest wall is altered by the abdominal weight. Um, there's a whole number of factors that haven't really been clearly defined or looked at in the literature. Again, mostly because some of these uh, studies would exclude patients with that category, uh, but I do agree that I'm not saying that we shouldn't be practicing that. I think that makes sense that you would have the EPAP level to that OSA level. The problem you're going to find is that these patients are then going to start having problems with interface leaks. And I think that's the challenge for clinicians is like, how do you provide the appropriate support level um, without having to strap that mask on tighter? You have to worry about pressure sores, et cetera. So um, clearly the, these patients are a unique group that haven't been um, clearly identified or, or individually studied in, in a large fashion anyways that I've been able to find. Thank you. The next question comes up with TUD of volumes in spontaneously breathing patients where we're trying to, and you spoke to this, we're trying to target a specific TUD of volume, but it's uh, a challenging for the clinician to sit there and make adjustments to try and optimize the TUD of volumes. Um, should there be a target TUD of volume in these patients 
especially those that are only on S ST without a set rate. Yeah, this is a this is a challenge. In in terms of title volumes, I think we need to um, look back at what what is considered normal. And normal tidal volume for for mammals, for example, is 6.3 mils per kilo. Um, we know that in patients that are with with high dry, this may be higher. Um, but in terms of titrate and the inspiratory pressure, I, I think that really the the take home point of that message was if if we don't know because of leaks, et cetera, what tidal volume is actually appropriate uh, for patients who deli being delivered non-invasive ventilation, we have to consider the evidence that's coming forth now. So again, this is one study. It should be validated in a larger uh, randomized trial. But I if we're aware of the tidal volume, I think that should, again, indicate to us that this patient may likely fail. But in terms of what's the best tidal volume for non-invasive, that might be up for debate. Um, because is six mils the most appropriate level, uh, or is eight mils per kilo the appropriate level? We don't really know the exact level. We just know the threshold at which failure seems to be more common in hypoxic patients, at least, um, with with that recent study. But in terms of like what we should target, um, when I'm in the ICU and we even we're, if we're talking about invasive ventilated patients, um, whether or not they have ARDS, I personally feel that six mils per kilo is a reasonable target because that's what mammals breathe on average. Um, and, but we, we do vary, so six to eight is typically acceptable. Uh, but with all of the more uh, recent studies looking at tidal volumes 10 mils or higher with the increased risk of lung injury, I think it it sort of this non-invasive ventilation target of 9.4, or this threshold of 9.5 kind of supports that idea that once we get close to 10, we really probably aren't doing safe things to the lungs. I don't know if that answered the question. It was sort of a ramble there. I apologize. That's okay, because the, I don't think the answer is clear or has been defined. The next question, and this will probably be the last one in non-invasive ventilation, and then we'll move on to high flow nasal cannula, is what about humidification? Um, because even if the patient is just wearing it for hours of sleep, is humidification necessary um, during non-invasive ventilation? And uh, Majkin, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, and uh, asked that question. This this is a very um, interesting topic because even when I read these papers, not a lot of them confirm or deny whether or not they're using heated humidification. Um, what we and again, they're in studies looking at humidified or not humidified, um, and Mike can correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't seen um, the exact evidence in terms of outcomes. Uh, supporting the use of um, heated humidity in this population. Having said that, we do have studies looking at comfort and tolerance and finding that comfort and tolerance is related to the humidification provided. So uh, what I typically ask uh, when I would deal with students that as I'd say, have you ever worn non-invasive ventilation? Yes, I have. Okay, let's try it on. And then basically when you, when you actually ask someone to compare heated versus non-heated, like in other words, a healthy volunteer, they are clearly aware of the comfort issues. Um, and the thing is, is a sick patient aware of this difference? They may not be. Uh, I don't know that we have, again, I haven't seen it, but maybe Mike uh, can comment. I haven't seen outcome improvements with heated or not, but I, we have seen, definitely seen uh, comfort data, so comfort and tolerance of therapy related to the humidification provided. So I personally feel like if I was wearing non-invasive, I would hope to have heated humidity uh, provided to my to my circuit. Um, I've worn both heated and dry, and I definitely noticed, but I'm, I'm not a sick patient, so. Um. Yes, uh, Rich Branson and I tried to answer this question in a paper I think we wrote in 2010, and there wasn't strong evidence to or or, or against it, um, and it's basically based on how effective the therapy is in the beginning, and a lot of people didn't want to use their precious resources of a heated wire circuit until they confirmed the patient was going to either be intubated or go on. A housekeeping note is we will, because we've gotten so many questions, this uh, question and answer session will, will likely go on past the top of the hour, and I apologize for those of you who have to uh, go back to seeing patients, but we have uh, got a lot of great questions. Um, so, Tom, now I'm going to move on to high-flow nasal cannula. And there's been a tremendous uh, number of questions about um, we all can assume 
Um, but is there any evidence that this is really flow dependent peak? Meaning if you go up on the peak from th or the flow from 30 to 60, is there CPAP or PEEP generated uh, with the patient? Yeah, this, this has been addressed in a few physiological studies looking at, you know, the oral pharynx pressure at the back of the throat. And of course, when you look at this, um, when you look at these studies, it's, it's not very impressive where you see that if the mouth is closed, it may provide three centimeters of water. Um, if the mouth is open, it may be one centimeter of water. Most of these patients are breathing quite dynamically. They're likely not all keeping their mouth closed. Um, so what's What's more fascinating, and this is just this just sort of blows my mind from a physiology standpoint, is that there are studies, for example, in post-op cardiac patients, when with lo looking with electrical impedance tomography, that when placed on high flow nasal cannula, there was an increase in the end expiratory lung impedance volume, um, with pressures of one to three centimeters of water. It just it if it baffles me and it fascinates me that you can have an increase in end expiratory lung volume, but this is what's happening. And this also was in, in that study I mentioned earlier by Tomas Amari looking at the physiological effects. Um, they found an increase in transpulmonary pressure, end expiratory transpulmonary pressure. It's not mentioned in that table, but they did look at end expiratory lung impedance with electrical impedance tomography and also found an increase in this in end expiratory lung volume. Um, so whether or not it has to do with lowering someone's respiratory rate, they're changing the pattern of breathing, it's, it's very difficult to to assume what the mechanism is, but to simply label it as I'm providing PEEP is not, it's, it, it, it's not accurate because we don't actually have the proof that there's sufficient amount of PEEP to do what we've been thinking CPAP, for example, has been doing in, in these patients or EPAP. Having said that, many of the studies, as I mentioned, use lower levels of EPAP, um, so like five to 10, but if you told me you were gonna try to achieve 10 centimeters of water in, with high flanesal cannula, I, I, I'd be like, okay, that's interesting because I haven't seen that level of, of, um, of pressure being measured uh, in the oral pharynx. But it, like, like I said, there's, there may be other mechanisms as to why end expiratory lung impedance is increasing unrelated to the generation of positive end expiratory pressure, if that, if that answers that question at all. <laughs> so there are several studies by uh, Cheryl Park was the first person to measure this. And there's been other studies, but um, that's in a, a research setting. Clinically, we know it's there, but we can't measure it, unfortunately. But now we're gonna talk about a different topic, which is the home use. Uh, is there any evidence that this would be a great, uh, uh, if we can get the patients who are not weanable off high blow nasal cannula, can we get them to go to the, um, to the home on high flow nasal cannula? There has definitely been a shift here in Ontario and Canada. Um, we are sending a lot more patients home on high flow nasal cannula than we were before um, with the use of devices uh, like home, like not just home devices, but some of the similar devices we're using in the hospital. I'll just give an example of the AIRVO or the Air, AIRVO 2. Uh, I know that there's sort of a, there's a mechanism for some of our home care companies. That's the device that they're carrying. So much like a CPAP device, these patients would uh, get this device set up in the home and then titrate like T oxygen into this device. So we are seeing an increase in that. Um, it's probably going to be different depending on where where you where you are. Um, then this is for those patients that just from a tolerance standpoint, they either need high levels of FiO2 or it's just, most of these patients I would say probably lean towards the interstitial pulmonary fibrosis uh, type of patient category. Those tend to be the patients that once they're on it, they absolutely love the therapy because it provides a high inspiratory flow and that's what they need. Um, whether or not it takes off, I'm not sure. Um, it seems to be picking up in Ontario, but I don't know if maybe someone from the U.S. or Mike yourself, if you're aware of any of any of this going on for transitioning patients home. Uh, there is growing support for that um, in in many uh, places here in the U.S. The there's several questions that have been posed about how how is the best way to deliver aerosol therapy both to patients on non-invasive ventilation and on uh, high flow nasal cannulas. Can you address that please? The, there was actually a recent article published and I believe um, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Dean Hess was uh, involved with this uh, study, or not a study, I think it was more of an editorial or review looking at um, 
nebulized therapy delivered through uh, high nasal cannula. And if I'm not mistaken, um, oh, I'd have to I'd have to quickly uh, review it to answer this question accurately. But essentially, um, it depends on the size of the cannula, the flow rate to the patient, etc. Whereas if someone's on high nasal cannula, you may be better off delivering your normal. Um, your normal mechanisms, for example, um, a face mask with, uh, with, with MDI or with the Aerogen, for example, as a, a device to deliver uh, humidif or not humidification, um, um, nebulized therapy. Uh, I do know that there are some hospitals, I remember seeing a, a poster, I know some people are using high nasal cannula with delivering things like epiprostanol. Again, this has not been studied in, in, in um, is it, well, hasn't been published work, so we really don't uh, we don't know if there's just people thinking it's a good idea to do things with high flow cannula and nebulization. But so far, we don't have the data, to my understanding, that supports it as just as good a way of deliver uh, d delivering nebulized medication. So we likely should stick to what we know. And Mike, maybe you can remember um, the comments from that article I'm referring to. C correct, because both of these um, are a paradigm shift, non-invasive ventilation and the high flow nasal cannula, because instead of intubating the patients, we have a lot of people um, in our ICUs on these two uh, interfaces, and a lot of times their only respiratory care will be um, these devices with uh, even a vibrating mesh nebulizer, and they avoid intubation, which I think is good for the patients. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, our time has run out. I apologize that we could not get to all your great questions. Um, and this is um, certainly Tom's um, email address and other things if you want to do that or if you want to email me. I thank you for your participation. We had a great audience today and a lot of thoughtful questions. I'll now turn it back over to Emily. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time, both Tom for this informative presentation and as well to you, Mike, for being our moderator today. It's been such a pleasure working with both of you. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the live audience today, and as well those of you in a future time who are attending this recorded session. We thank you for your time and your thoughtful attention. And now this does conclude our session for today. Take care, everyone, and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.